Hi there. This is Matt. I want to talk a little bit about uh, respondent and operant conditioning um, as it pertains to distinctions that uh, we make in learning and conditioning, especially with respect to Skinner and behavior analysis. So this is going to be a little bit of a review of what respondent conditioning is and what operant conditioning is and how they're alike and how they differ. So when we talk about respondent conditioning, I'm going to start with one I think you could say one form of that in which uh, most of us have had some experience with and that is Pavlovian conditioning. Pavlovian conditioning always starts with a reflex relation that is a stimulus response relationship. In, in Pavlov's terms we call those an unconditional stimulus and an unconditional response. Now a reflex is something that you're born with as a, as a member of the, of the species. Um, uh, humans have certain reflexes that they're that are inborn. Birds have certain reflexes. Other mammals have certain reflexes. But um, in in Pavlov's term terms, those are called an unconditional stimulus. And an unconditional stimulus is defined as a stimulus that produces an unconditional response. It's a stimulus that produces a response without learning. And we say things like the U.S. elicits the U.R. when speaking of these things. So we abbreviate unconditional stimulus US and unconditional response UR. This is a simple reflex relationship. Now, if we add a neutral or novel stimulus, an NS, to the US, and then the US produces a UR, over time what we see is we see that that stimulus becomes a conditional stimulus that produces the conditional response on its own the conditional stimulus elicits the conditional response. So that's technically an overview of what is going on, that conceptually or theoretically what's going on. Let's talk about the, uh, an example or, 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 you know, try to put some bones to the, you know, some skin on these bones. So again, we start with the US-UR relationship. An unconditional stimulus produces an unconditional response without prior experiences or conditions. If you get dust in your eye, you blink. If you get an object in your windpipe, you gag. If you hear a loud noise, you might look or startle or jump. If you get food on your tongue, uh, if food is placed on your tongue, you'll salivate. These are unconditional responses. These are reflexes that you come born with. Now a novel stimulus or a new stimulus is a stimulus that doesn't elicit the target response but it may elicit some unrelated response. So for example if I were to shine a bright red light in your eyes you might look at it. Um, if I make a noise you might turn your head. If I put dust in your eye you may blink. But notice that if I put uh, if I shine a red light you won't blink. That is not a reflex. If I if I play a noise, you won't salivate. Okay, so so novel stimuli or neutral stimuli are stimuli that don't elicit a target response. Okay, in the Pavlovian conditioning ar arrangement, now what I do is I add a new stimulus. So I'll play the red light. I'll present the red light, blow dust in your eye, and you will blink. If I do that again you'll blink. If I do that again, you'll blink. If I do that again, you'll blink. And if I, if there's one, one important feature about Pavlovian condition we know is the time in between these events. We call these, each one of these, a trial, if you will. Um, if we do this a few times, and we're a little bit lucky, what we find is if we play the red light, you will blink. The red light now is considered to be a conditional stimulus, and the eye blink that it, that it elicits is called a conditional response. Now, the unconditional response and conditional response can look the same, or they can be different. That's why we distinguish between an unconditional response and a conditional response, is because they actually can be different. In fact, they can be opposite of one another. The CS elicits the CR due to prior conditioning, and hence we call it conditioned responding. Now notice in this arrangement, the behavior that you get, the response that you get, cannot be specified. It's what you get. The conditioned response is the conditioned response. 
new behavior cannot be taught using Pavlovian conditioning. Existing behavior may be brought under the control of new stimuli, but new behavior, a new form or, uh, of behavior, cannot be taught in this arrangement. Pavlov didn't teach his dogs how to salivate. They, they, they did that already. He taught them to salivate when a metronome ticked. So he brought salivation under the control of a novel stimulus that didn't elicit salivation but prior to that. <clears throat> So, what we know about Pavlovian conditioning is that there is a dependency, or what we call a contingency, between two important events in this arrangement. And the two important events are the CS and the US. And it turns out that in information processing, if you want to apply the lessons from that, we could see the CS has to be informative of the US. It's to tell the organism about the oncoming or incoming U.S. That's the, the key. It has to provide information to the uh, organism about, an expectation about what's going to happen. Now, our U.S. D defined by its effects. It is a stimulus that elicits a U.R. And here the directionality is the key. You have a stimulus, then a response. Stimulus, response. <clears throat> now, what if the opposite happens. What if a response produces some stimulus? And it almost always does. But this is the opposite of Pavlovian conditioning. This is, what if there's some dependency between stimuli being presented based on responses? This is a two-term contingency where a response produces a stimulus. Like when you press a button on your computer, your computer turns on. If this, now, if this particular stimulus that's just been produced has an effect on the probability of that response in the future, we call this the law of effect. And in this arrangement, we're not talking about Pavlovian conditioning anymore or respondent conditioning. We're talking about operant conditioning because the relation now is reversed. In Pavlovian conditioning, remember, we have a stimulus producing a response. We're going to flip that around and call it operant conditioning when a response produces an important stimulus. If the stimulus feeds back onto the future likelihood of the response that produces it under or in similar conditions, that's what we call operant conditioning. The behavior or a response produces a stimulus. This is a two-term operant relationship. Now, what Skinner pointed out was that there are almost always events or situations that come before the behavior. Those situations or events he called discriminative stimuli or dis uh, discriminative stimulus. So when we talk about this operant conditioning relationship, we talk about the discriminative stimulus, the behavior, and the consequence, or the discriminative stimulus, the behavior, and the stimuli that it pro that the behavior produces. We also refer to this as the ABCs of operant behavior, which are antecedent behavior consequence. Now, the discriminative stimulus in a three-term contingency sets the occasion for a particular response to produce a particular consequence. In, in other words, it signals the availability of a reinforcer for a particular response. Now, it doesn't elicit the response. It doesn't pull it out. It doesn't goad it. What, it says, what we say is it evokes it. We say it sets the occasion for. <clears throat> now, if we take a look at this three-term relationship and, sp and, and specifically look at C, one of the questions that's often raised is what makes this an important event or change in the environment? What's, what, 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 why is this stimulus, this consequence over here, this right, the response produces a stimulus, we call this a consequence, what makes this important? Why is it important? Well, it's important because it's been established as such. And so when we talk about a four-term contingency, what we're talking about are operations, including, including operations that, what we would say, potentiate a class of events as important consequences. So establishing or motivating operations are operations or manipulations that establish a class of events as, an important, as important consequences. Walking through the desert 
is an establishing operation that makes water an important consequence of behavior for some behavior. It makes it a reinforcer. Getting a cut makes a band-aid a reinforcer. Drinking too much the night before makes your alarm a punisher in the morning. So events that potentiate a class of events or establish a class of events as important consequences are what we call establishing operations. Now we call them establishing operations because they are directly observable. They're in principle processes and events that we can manipulate. So to summarize, we are going to view all the behavior that man and human, man and animals exhibit as either respondent behavior or operant behavior. And I'd like you to um, uh, uh, consider this sort of rubric, this umbrella, um, at, at length. Respondent behavior includes reflexes, both simple reflexes and what we call fixed action patterns, which are also reflex-like but more complicated. They include behavior that's generated through Pavlovian or classical conditioning, like forward conditioning or simultaneous conditioning, also taste aversion learning, which we think of as a special case of Pavlovian conditioning, also adjunctive behavior, we largely consider to be uh, respondent behavior. Instinctive drift is also respondent behavior, if you read about instinctive drift. In other words, we call it respondent because the organism responds to the world. A stimulus occurs, the organism responds. Operant behavior is reinforced behavior through positive and negative reinforcement, punished behavior through positive and negative punishment. We also consider imitative and observational learning as forms of operant conditioning, operant learning or operant behavior in behavior analysis. And operant comes from the word operate. This is when the, uh, the organism operates on the world. Instead of the world operating on them, they are operating on the world. And these are the two forms of learning, two forms of behavior that we're going to be emphasizing.